on the scene He's got the voice that's mean Asking those questions that you never seen He's got that fire Burning bright and clean Andrew Keen Making waves Break the routine On the keen on show He brings the heat Asking the minds Digging deep till they bleed No sugar coated truths No lies to deceive Andrew Keen The master of the interview beat the knowledge he's got the flair challenging ideas with a fearless stare with every question he's uncovering what's there andrew key the true seeker he's aware hello everybody uh, a few days ago we did a show with my old friend gary marcus an ai expert the author of uh, how we can ensure that ai works for us we've done so many shows on AI, it seems as if it's taken for granted that it will dominate the next few technological decades. But there's another story also brewing, the story of quantum computing, which we've done fewer shows on. It's less glitzy, less self-evident, but perhaps in some ways equally, if not more important in terms of the future of America and the future of the world. My guest today Martin Schmidt is the president of Rensselaer Polytechnic University, uh, America's oldest and one of its most distinguished universities focusing on technology. Uh, and Rensselaer has just um, announced uh, a partnership with IBM to unveil the world's first IBM Quantum System One on a university campus at Rensselaer, of course. Um, Martin Schmidt, who is the president, is joining us today. Congratulations, Martin, on this uh, coup, is it? I mean, how did you convince IBM to do this? Well, it, uh, RPI and IBM go way back, the long-standing relationship. Uh, my board chair had previously been the head of IBM Research, and the current head of IBM Research, I knew when he was a graduate student, uh, at MIT and I was on the faculty. So we have a lot of personal connections and uh, we're successful in convincing them to place one of the computers on, on the RPI campus as the first university in the world to actually have one on our campus. Well, congratulations on that. Um, you were, I think you were there at MIT for 41 years. You know your technology. A lot of, you, you again, you know this better than I do. There's a lot of talk of quantum, some of it hype, some of it skeptical for our audience which might be technically relatively literate but not as sophisticated as you how would you explain quantum computing what exactly is it martin yeah well it's um you know it's it's and that's part of the challenge and part of the reason why we wanted to have a quantum computer is it's not uh easy to understand how quantum computer runs and and um and and how how you you will use it I'd say the simplest way to describe it is that at a fundamental level, many things in, in our physical world operate because of quantum mechanics. And so when you think about how molecules and atoms interact with each other, there, the, a lot of those interactions are fundamentally quantum mechanical in nature. But they're extraordinarily complex uh, to understand and to model using classic computers. But by having a computer that operates under the principles of quantum mechanics, you actually can model things that are fundamentally quantum mechanical in nature. And it, that's, the, I think, the easiest way to explain it is that while quantum mechanical things are very difficult to simulate in a classic computer, by moving to a quantum computer, we can actually start to solve these problems uh, more simply. Is there something almost surreal about some of the principles underlining not just quantum computing, but quantum technology, that it radically undermines how we think, for example, about time. Yeah, exactly. And, and, the, and the theories of you know, quantum mechanical theory is, is quite challenging for people to wrap their head around. And, and you know, I think one of the reasons why we were keen to get the quantum computer is we feel it's really important uh, for us to start trying to understand what are these quantum computers going to be really good for? What kind of problems are they particularly well suited to solve? But also more importantly, perhaps, you can't expect someone in the future that's going to program a quantum computer to have to understand things like entanglement and coherence 
and various principles in quantum mechanical theory. And so that means you have to develop abstractions. And that's something that, you know, educators, universities are good at doing. Uh, it's the same as, you know, today, you don't need to understand how a transistor operates in order to program a silicon based uh, classic computer. And so, so we need to get to a place where everyone can effectively utilize quantum computing without having to have a deep understanding of quantum mechanics. It's interesting that IBM, of course, have been around for more than a century. I think they were founded in New York. I know you have a close relationship with them, both at RPI and probably personally. Um, but isn't it also important to note, uh, Martin, that quantum computers aren't just bigger versions or more powerful versions of what we take for granted at computers today? The original IBM computers fitted into a room, for example, and their physical size was always... The, the the lead feature in all stories about these new computers after uh, the second world war what exactly physically does this new ibm quantum computer look like on your campus is it in a big room does it require a lot of uh heat or, or, or cooling it's a, it's it's a great question by the way but it's actually quite small compared to uh you know we have a we have one of the um fastest uh, supercomputers uh, on our campus in, in any private university in the country. Um, and that supercomputer is what you classically would think of. It's in a big room, it has a lot of cooling and electrical power. Um, the quantum computer actually that we've installed on the campus is, is a 10 foot by 10 foot box, basically. Uh, and then another set of uh, infrastructure that sits beneath that uh, on a lower floor. So so dimensionally it's it's actually much smaller than our high performance computer and uh consequently it doesn't draw as much power and things like that why then is it such a big deal it's this small thing why can't all universities have them i mean how much and i i, I excuse the rather vulgar question here but uh, how much did it cost ibm to actually produce one of these things well, they, if you get an IBM quantum system one, it's typically, you know, tens of millions of dollars uh, per year to have it. Um, so, the, so it's a not inexpensive uh, venture to, to get one of these quantum computers. But, uh, you know, they're, they're new. There's a lot of proprietary um, uh, content within the quantum computer itself. So, so I think they're understandably anxious to make sure that they don't, um, you know, uh, distribute them to a lot of places where they might, somebody might get under the hood, if you will, and understand how, um, how IBM makes their quantum computer. So, so there, we operate with a certain amount of control over access to the computer uh, to respect that concern about the proprietary nature. Your life's been in the tech industry one way or the other as a teacher, a researcher, Martin. IBM maybe I'm being slightly unfair, but I think there's some truth to this. IBM have missed the bus. They missed the bus on personal computing. It was Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, who stole their so-called personal computer and made it popular. Uh, they certainly missed the bus on the internet. Um, and, and in some sense, they're more of a relic, a historical curiosity as a big tech company than, than a Microsoft or a Google today. Do you think that IBM, I know you're not speaking on their behalf, but are they concerned and have they learned from the past in terms of making sure that they don't miss the bus on quantum? Um, well, I would say that, you know, the, their investment in AI that led to Watson, you know, was, was a big. Yeah. And I missed that. Well, it was, but again, it's, it's open AI now that's a private company that's worth a hundred and bill, $150 billion companies. It wasn't IBM who, who uh, who uh, got to the LLMs? It was it was OpenAI and Google. It, it generative AI, no question. But I think that uh, you know they're right there now, and 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 I think their customers are not are much more businesses than individuals. So you don't often think about you know who are they serving, but that their business is really about supporting other businesses. And then I think with quantum. Um, you know they've made remarkable progress, and and what's interesting to me personally about IBM is that their steadfast commitment to the research center. Um, uh, when you think of all the various research laboratories that used to exist, Bell Labs associated with Bell, Bell mm. Corporation, RCA Labs, 
IBM's labs are one of the last uh, really serious corporate research labs. Okay, Martin, we've been circling this, and and I know it's a tricky one, but what ideally, I mean, you're not a science fiction writer, but there is a science fictional quality to quantum. We've made it clear, you've underlined the fact that quantum computers and quantum computing isn't just a, uh, a faster uh, version of traditional computing. It actually represents a profound shift. What kinds of things in the 21st century will quantum computing be able to do that traditional computing can't? Yeah. So I think maybe the best example and the one where you're likely to see some of the first uh, uptake of the technology is in sort of in the area of materials synthesis, materials discovery. And, you know, the way I think about it, <clears throat> that that has been evolving with every new generation of computing technology. But certainly if you go back to the 50s or 60s, um, materials discovery was very Edisonian, meaning, you know, you might have someone who had a deep understanding of decades and decades of literature in a particular material, and maybe you're trying to make that material uh, stronger or more resistant to corrosion or something like that. And so you go in the laboratory and you synthesize different uh, versions of that material with different additives and test it. Um, with uh, and, and what you relied on was uh, that one individual who had a deep uh, knowledge and, and, and memory of everything that had been published about that material. Uh, obviously, with the development of, um, of advanced computing, online search, and then ultimately machine learning, it's made you less reliant on that deep uh, understanding of the literature in order to um, get close to what you want before you go into the lab and synthesize it. And then the other interesting thing that happened in the, is, that, is that the lab has actually gone on the cloud where you can, you can submit jobs to have materials synthesized in remote laboratories and, and then have the material sent to you. So, so there's been a high degree of automation and a lot of use of advanced computation to understand materials. What quantum allows us to do is to actually model what might happen when those atoms inter interact inside the material and how would that translate into a particular property that you desire. And so you get considerably closer to the point of being able to design a material to a specific material property and to do it all on the quantum computer, augmented by classic computers, and we could talk about that. Um, and then go into the lab once to synthesize the material. And that's a radical uh, step forward in material science. But how and, did and that, drug discovery for that matter. I mean, it sounds interesting, but has it changed the world? Those huge IBM computers, which existed in refrigerated rooms, now we carry around in our pockets. Is it conceivable, Martin, that in 50 or 75 years, We'll all be walking around with quantum computers, maybe not in our pockets, but embedded in our heads or our hands. Well, what and, I would say is maybe, that, that's an, maybe it's the wrong way of thinking of it. Yeah, it may be. But, but what I would say is, um, and people represent this different ways, but uh, if you think of um, classic high-performance computers being comprised of CPUs, and now today, you know, we have uh, for generative AI, the use of GPUs. Um, think of quantum computer as a QPU. And I think what, what everybody's moving towards is the notion that you, what, what you would love to be in the position of is you pose a problem to a computer that's comprised of CPUs, GPUs, and QPUs. And that computer figures out which parts of the problem are best solved with a CPU, a GPU or a QPU. So I think, you know, the, the holy grail, if you will, is, is a computer that comprises each of those types of processing units. What does quantum mean for Moore's law in terms of this law that was, was put together by Gordon Moore, one of the co-founders of IBM, um, for which is the, the foundation, the operating system of, 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 of the world today. Does quantum compound Moore's law? Does it represent a new kind of world of computing where the power of chips is redundant and we have to think of things differently? 
Well, yeah, I think it's, you know, I mean, really Moore's law was about how you scaled silicon devices uh, in order to get more transistors per unit area of a wafer. And then the, and then the economic value associated with that. Um, and, you know, we've, we've found that over the past decade or so very challenging to follow Moore's law. In fact, I don't think people necessarily think of it that way anymore because uh, you, you know, you hit some headwinds particularly. Right. And there, there is a, in, 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 in physics, in, in terms of physics, there is a, a physical wall that some people at least argue Moore's law will eventually crash into the certain point. You're just not going to be able to physically produce uh, a chip, which, doubles in in size because it's just physically impossible yeah and and so what's happening is the the architecture and the materials are being changed to to continue to squeeze performance out of the transistor but it may be that the transistor itself uh is is changing shape and and being reduced in size in that way so there's a lot going on there that it sort of departs from moore's law as a classic uh what they call denard scaling but i think the point about quantum is when you when you go from a one bit to two bit to four bit, you, you double the performance of the of the computer. So you know when we went from sixteen bit to thirty two bit processors, you get effectively a doubling of of the of the processing power. Um, with qubits, there's an exponential uh, growth that occurs with the addition of qubits. So what's interesting in many ways about quantum computers is that you don't have to go from you, you know if you go from ten qubits to a, a you know 100 qubits you get this exponential growth in 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 computing power versus you know the sort of linear growth that you would have gotten from a classic computer so i think when you think about scaling with a quantum computer it's more um that exponential growth where are we martin in the in the narrative of quantum uh, I, I mean you don't know of course for sure nobody knows but um people often talk about these things in terms of baseball and innings we certainly haven't even arrived at the field yet have we when it comes to the history of quantum so the term everybody has slightly different terminology but um you know what what i would say is the the aspiration is to get to what people would call quantum supremacy where you can solve problems with a quantum computer that you'll never in your lifetime be able to solve with a classic computer um Right now, a lot of people would argue that we're at the level of what's called quantum utility. And what they mean by that is today, if you wanted to program, if you wanted to run a program on a quantum computer, you can build a, a simulator that runs on a classic computer, but that operates as if it was a quantum computer. And you could run algorithms on that simulator. Um, today, we're at the point where the quantum computers that are being produced and the system one that we have on our campus achieves quantum utility, which means that it can run uh, algorithms as fast or faster than a classic computer. So, so you're at the point now where you can actually uh, run programs on a quantum computer and not have to rely on a simulator uh, from a, on a classic computer. And so that's, that's an important first step because we're now, you know, in the quantum realm and, and getting real understanding how those quantum computers operate. And then the goal, of course, is to get to quantum supremacy. Everyone have, has arguments about when that'll be. Some would say it'll be in three years. Some would say it'll be five years. Some don't believe it'll ever achieve. So, you know, that's a, a great deal of um, uh, speculation, I would say, that people have. Is it a similar uncertainty to the one surrounding AGI? Uh, some people believe it it's impossible. Some people believe it's imminent. Others simply argue that it, it will happen in the in the distant future. What's your take on 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 the future of quantum? Yeah, my, my view is that I, I'm in the camp of believing that we're going to be seeing uh, quantum supremacy in four to six years. I think there's enough uh, progress, particularly in the last several years, uh, that have been made, especially in doing, uh, mitigating some of the errors that people encounter with a quantum computer. You know, so I think some of the predictions and some of the suggestions that we'll never get there were based on having to get a perfect quantum computer. And, and recent, more recently, some work has been done to really help uh, understand how you can take a, a quantum computer that has a certain level of error 
and mitigate those errors. And it's interestingly enough, it's often done by pairing the quantum computer up with a classic computer. So if we get to quantum supremacy in the next, say, five to 10 years, give me one concrete real world area where this quantum supremacy can actually change the nature of things. Might it be, for example, in figuring out cures to cancer? Absolutely, because I think, you know, when you talk about drug discovery, again, these molecules all operate based on quantum mechanical principles. So the, the, the example I gave earlier, with the ability to calculate uh, exactly how a material is going to behave or a molecule is going to function uh, before you go out and synthesize it, um, I think is, is a breakthrough. What other areas? How will it intersect with AI? Well, I think they'll be complementary, you know, so I think you're going to you're going to see, um, uh, you know, the, the quantum classic computer right next to the quantum computer, each of them solving parts of the problem that uh, they're best suited for. Um, you know, you can't store data in a quantum computer. So, you know, when you think about um, large language models and how you train them, um, that's, you know, those are going to be good for that purpose, but not for what the quantum computer will do. As you know, uh, Martin, there's lots of fear and nervousness about these big new AI companies. Uh, Gary Marcus has a book about how we can ensure that AI works for us. Is this going to be the case with quantum? Every new wave of technology from the personal computer to the internet to Web 2 to, uh, to, to AI seems to have gone with the appearance of larger and larger, perhaps more mo monopolistic tech companies, more powerful companies, Amazon, Google, Microsoft. Should we be fearful of uh, a company that, maybe not a company like IBM, but a new company that will achieve what you call quantum supremacy? Is this something, I mean, I, I understand that, that it, it will, could theoretically benefit society, but is it also going to be the kind of technology that will make these companies even more powerful financially, uh, economically, and perhaps politically? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I would say, you know, the, the, probably the, the biggest fear with respect to quantum computing is its capacity to break the RSS encryption. Um, and so what, what happens when you have that moment where you can now de-encrypt all this information that's out there uh, that's encrypted through RSS. So um, that's certainly one concern. Um, and people are developing better encryption algorithms that are quantum resilient, I guess I would say, or quantum resistant. So, so I think that when people worry about um, the negative effects potentially of a quantum computer achieving quantum supremacy, oftentimes the first thing you think about is that what it's going to mean to all that encryption. Um, but with respect to, you know, is one company going to dominate? It's hard for me to see that because I think it's a, it's a piece of hardware as opposed to, um, you know, anything else. And, and I think there are a number of companies that are competing to sell quantum computers today. And uh, so I think right now you have a bit of a competitive landscape. I mean, billions of dollars are being poured, perhaps fewer billions than into AI, but billions of dollars are being poured into into uh quantum aren't they yeah I, I haven't i don't know the exact number but I'm, i wouldn't be i'm sure nobody knows days. the exact number but certainly i mean even the big tech companies like google and microsoft have their own quantum initiatives yeah. right right well it's all speculative but interesting well let's come back and back down to earth to the white house's chips and science act i know that also at rpi um you're working uh, on the chips front, particularly with uh, Micron computers, uh, and you've been involved in their initiative to set up a new uh, memory manufacturing center. Tell us about what's happening on that front, your relationship with Micron, and how that's changing, not the future, but the current nature of, uh, of America, uh, technology, and RPI. Yeah. Well, you know, I'd start by saying that, interestingly enough, 
uh, RPI was probably one of the first universities uh, to have a, a microelectronics uh, research and curriculum activity uh, in, in the early 60s, shortly after the discovery of the of the of the semiconductor silicon semiconductors and transistors. So it's it's been a large part of our legacy is is working in this space. The Chips and Science Act, the 52 billion dollars, uh, which is targeted to basically reshore semiconductor manufacturing in the U.S. The reason why Micron um, is uh, committing to building a capacity in upstate New York is really because of the existence of what's called Albany Nanotech. Um, Albany Nanotech is a, uh, a roughly $15 billion facility about six miles from the Rensselaer campus. And it's basically where they have all the equipment you need to develop state-of-the-art semiconductors. And as you may know, the development of, of a next generation chip technology is an incredibly expensive undertaking and requires this kind of $15 billion facility. Uh, and, and we have it here in, in the capital region. And so companies like Global Foundries, IBM, Micron, Applied Materials, they all have significant presence in, the, in, in adjacent to the Albany Nanotech so that they can rely on that facility to develop their next generation Micron uh, memory technology or so on. So we're working with Micron, we're working with IBM, we're working with Global Foundries, a lot applied materials, and really on multiple fronts, uh, some in research, like thinking about what are some of the new materials that'll be brought into mainstream semiconductors to advance the technology. Some of it in the area of workforce development. Um, you know, it's one thing to say you, you're going to build all these new factories, but then you also have to fill them up with people that know how to operate them. And I think the numbers I've heard from Micron is when they fully realize their goals in upstate New York, it's going to amount to, I think, 9,000 jobs. Um, and, and it's an interesting uh, challenge because as, you know, and, and this is coming from somebody who, you know, when I left RPI to go to MIT for my PhD, I began my research in semiconductors. And so I've been in the semiconductor industry as a researcher um, for a long time. But, you know, as, as the industry started moving offshore in the, in the 80s and 90s and into the 2000s, the universities stopped hiring faculty that worked in mainstream silicon technology because, you know, the jobs for the PhD students weren't there. And so uh, it, it's an interesting conundrum in that, uh, in order to help Micron and everyone else get those 9,000 employees, the, the universities have to um, have their own workforce development challenge, which is bringing more talent uh, in to do the, the research and to do the teaching. Um, and so one of the things that we're benefiting from is while semiconductors did largely move offshore with the exception of places like Intel in Portland uh, and some places in Arizona and Texas, uh, in this region, they've stayed, you know, so you've got IBM and Global Foundries. And so we have, we have a number of PhD scientists and engineers who have spent 30 or 40 years in the industry. And we've been bringing them to the campus to help us restock and, and, and uh, develop the modern training that we need for this workforce. Why is this a, a story, not just this story, but other stories like this that we don't know about? You're the president of RPI rather than the American president. I'm sure like the rest of us, Martin, you've been following the presidential election, lots of talk of people in Ohio eating pets and other weird stories. Uh, these sorts of stories aren't heard. What's your sense? I, I mean, you're, you're, you're not a political appointment, so I'm, I'm not necessarily trying to find out whether you'd vote for biden or trump but there are a lot of a lot of uh, announcements from the biden administration a lot of money was poured into the chips and science act there's not a lot uh it's not self-evident what's that's achieved is in your sense have have these investments of the biden administration been in some ways foundational for a, a new wave of innovation in america yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. So let, let's just start with the the investments. So largely, the money is going to uh, to uh, basically support the companies to build the facilities in the U.S. Uh, and and including companies like TSMC to build in the U.S. Um, 
that is obviously going to help us and, and we won't find ourselves necessarily in the situation we were in during the COVID era when Ford couldn't ship F-150s for lack of a fairly basic computer chip. Um, so having a, a domestic supply base for computer chips, but also having partnerships, for example, uh, Rapidus is a company that just got created in Japan uh, that they, they today have about 200 engineers in Albany learning two nanometer technology so that they can build it in their factory in Hokkaido. Um, so I think the, the first step obviously is catalyzing the creation of these new facilities uh, in the United States and elsewhere with friendly nations. Uh, and, and what we're trying to do is really just get ahead of it in terms of making sure that we're producing the, the workforce uh, that, those, uh, that those fabs are gonna need. Um, and so I think, you know, time will tell how successful it's going to be, but, but the fabs are getting built. And I think the, the portfolio of investments, uh, it beyond the actually just getting the fabs, but also making sure that we're supporting some of the research that will lead to the next generation of chip technology. I, you know, I think overall it's a, it's a, it's a bold commitment, but I think it's sized appropriately for the goal. You. You uh, conveniently dodged the political question, quite understandably. At RPI, you, in part of your marketing material and bringing new students in, you talk about come change the world with us. It's not come change America. I'm guessing that RPI, at RPI, you have a lot of Chinese students, maybe quite a lot of relationships with Chinese technologists, Chinese tech companies, maybe even the Chinese government. What's your sense when it comes to these big technological issues of this growing economic nationalism in America, this notion of the world being a, an economic zero-sum game, and if China wins, America loses, and vice versa? Yeah, well, first of all, a lot, just a little bit of clarity. There, there's not a lot of Chinese folks up here in Rensselaer. <laughs> Uh, and we, we're, we tend to be more focused on a domestic uh, group. Um, but the, uh, I, I do think that it's really about, um, you know, securing access to the, to the chips. And, you know, obviously there's nervousness about uh, Taiwan. And if China decides to get more aggressive with Taiwan, when you consider how many companies rely singularly on TSMC that are based in the U.S., um, th those are reasonable concerns to have. And so I think, I, I don't know that it's about the U.S. beating China in, in, in having the best chips, but it's certainly about the U.S. being able to produce chips that it needs. Later this year, Martin, again, you don't need me to tell you this, uh, on November 5th uh, uh, of this year, uh, RPI will be celebrating its 200th anniversary. I think you're the oldest uh, technical uh, polytechnic university in America, even older than than MIT. Uh, you're the president of the university. You worked a lot with MIT. MIT has actually been in the news because of all the demonstrations uh, about uh, Gaza. Uh, the universities have been on the front page for reasons that probably keep presidents like yourself up late. Um, are you concerned about the future of university education in America? You're a technical university. I'm sure it's much less political at RPI than other universities, but we've done a number of shows on this. I even went to a new university in Austin to talk about a, uh, what they think of as a, a post-woke education. Does, is there a need for American educators and, and, and institutions like RPI to be reinventing themselves in the 21st century too? Yeah, I would say um, the, the short answer to your question is yes. Uh, and, and when you think about all the challenges that we face, the, the declining public perception of higher ed, the sense that, the, you know, that maybe a four-year college degree isn't the path to prosperity, um, concerns about, you know, the activism on campus, uh, concerns about the rising cost of the education. I mean, they, all these are legitimate issues that, as a university leader, you have to really think about what is what is our individual institution's response to that. And I say it that way because I think you have to also realize that higher ed is, is a very heterogeneous industry. Um, you have large public institutions, you have uh, well-endowed private institutions, you have 
more tuition dependent private institutions. And, you know, I used to be running, setting the budget for a very large, well endowed private institution. And now I'm at a much more tuition dependent private institution. And I can tell you, it's almost fundamentally a different business in terms of how you have to operate. And so we certainly, and particularly in this 200th year are spending time thinking about what is our strategic plan for the future and how are we going to respond to these uh, challenges? Finally, Martin, being very generous with your time, I know you're a big fan of a, a book co-authored by Jonathan Gruber, Simon Johnson, uh, both MIT people. Uh, Johnson's been on the show before. Uh, Jumpstarting America, how breakthrough science can revive economic growth and the American dream. What's your take as the president of RPI, a man who's interested in quantum and the, the future of technology as well as the current state of chips? What is the role of, of places like RPI and technology in jumpstarting America? It seems in some ways the more high-tech America becomes in certain areas, perhaps Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, Silicon Valley, uh, the, the less high-tech, uh, the more almost feudal other parts of America can become. Can, can America be jump-started broadly, or is it always going to be in pockets of innovation? Yeah. So this is a kind of a passion for me. And, and in fact, you know, uh, my d interest in returning to RPI uh, was really fueled by the sense that as a nation, uh, we need, um, we can't just survive. And this is really the thesis of Simon and John's book. We can't survive on a set of superstar cities. And you could pick them, Boston, Boston New York, LA, San Francisco. Um, we need more metropolitan areas in this nation to step forward economically. And so then the question is, well, how? And that's some of what Simon and John talk about in their book, but there's also studies that have been done uh, um, recently to try and understand what is it that allows certain metropolitan areas to thrive economically while others not so much. And, you know, having, having seen the transformation of Kendall Square in the 41 years I was there, where you went from when I when I arrived there as a graduate student, Kendall Square was seven parking lots, a couple of abandoned factories, and a diner. Today, what year was that? Cluster, 1981. Yeah, um, I came to. I, I mentioned before I I came to live in Central Square, just up the road from Ken, uh, uh, in Cambridge, just up the road from Kendall uh, in uh, the early 90s, and and I I've never been to a place which looks more different today than it did over the last. 30, yeah. 35 years. Exactly. But there's other examples. You know, you can look at Pittsburgh, um, which, you know, in the 70s and 80s is a Rust Belt city uh, and, and has gone through a pretty significant transformation. And so we've looked at that. We tried to understand what is it that allows certain regions to grow like that. And, and an interesting PhD work done by a guy named Ben Armstrong at MIT compared Pittsburgh and Cleveland. And, and what, what Ben learned was obviously one that Pittsburgh has done much better economically over the past 40 years than Cleveland, even though they were both um, ostensibly Rust Belt cities in the, back in the day. What, what you find is that in Pittsburgh, the economic development plan that was submitted to the governor of, of Pennsylvania in 19, I think it was 85, was co-authored by the presidents of Carnegie Mellon and University of Pittsburgh Medical. Um, and the punchline, and this is also in John and Simon's book, is that if you can find institutions that are deeply committed to a region and have the capacity to think long term, if they work together in a strategic way, that's what happens. That's how things transform. So what happened in Kendall Square? Well, MIT made a bold bet by pivoting its biology department towards molecular biology in, this, in the late 60s, or early 60s to late 60s. Um, actively encouraged companies to move to the region, partnered with Harvard and the research hospitals to create entities like the Broad Institute, and then worked with the governor's office to create a biotech investment fund of, to the, in Deval Patrick's case, it was a billion dollar program, a hundred million dollars a year spent to support the growth of that industry. So this is those institutions deeply committed to the region working together. Same thing happened in Pittsburgh. Um, Carnegie Mellon, Pitt, 
working together. People classically refer to it as eds and meds. So we know what the playbook is. We know what it takes to transform regions. Challenge is it takes about 40 years because that's the time it took to get Kendall Square. That's the time it took to turn uh, Pittsburgh around and become a robotics and other type of technological hub. And, uh, and, and interestingly enough, I mentioned earlier Albany Nanotech, which is bringing all that semiconductor activity to the region. Well, that actually has its origins back in the 80s. As a graduate student studying semiconductors, I recalled seeing ads in the trade magazines for the semiconductor industry that New York would run saying, we have shovel-ready sites in upstate New York for your fab. And so they had, they've had this 40-year commitment to, to strengthening semiconductors in this region. So to me, that knowing that that's what you have to do, Rensselaer is, a, is an institution that has the capacity to think long-term is deeply committed to this region. And so we're spending our time finding partners to see where we can create uh, an unfair advantages for the region, whether it's in semiconductors, whether it's in quantum computing. And what becomes then, of because they're always gonna be losers, uh, Martin, a Cleveland, a West Virginia, places in the old economy, maybe even one day Silicon Valley. Um, are there always, in your view, even in a, a, a jump-started America, are there always going to be have-nots, especially in this increasingly high-tech America? Well, that's a good question. I'm, I'm a I'm an eternal optimist, so I'd like to think that uh, every region, if they can get their act together, has the potential to see growth. And, you know, I mean, look, uh, while, you know, the, the biotech cluster in Kendall Square is 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 going to be very difficult to reproduce, just because of the density of talent, advanced scientific talent. However, it's become very difficult to manufacture, to do biomanufacturing in, in Massachusetts, in the greater Boston area, because of the cost of living, transportation, cost of construction. So that's an opportunity. That's an opportunity for another region to step forward and say, hey, we want to be a biomanufacturing hub um, and, and capture that piece of the economic puzzle. Well, Martin Schmidt, the president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, um, RPI in short. Uh, it's nice to have some optimism in an America which is, seems to be dominated by pessimism. Thank you so much. We'll have to get you back on the show, Martin, in the not too distant future when uh, maybe when quantum supremacy is a little closer. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Can I step on the scene?